All right, we'll start in here now on the second tape of the study on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We've already come quite a ways and give you quite a bit of material, and I hope, I'm sure you'll have to take that first tape real slow and stop it a lot if you want to write down those references and some of that material if you want to make a study on your own. However, I know that most people don't want to do that. They just want to hear what I got to say, and that's about it. But I hope that um, for you that really want to study the subject and take some time with it, that you'll do that. We owe it to people to do our homework on this subject and be able to answer them according to what the Bible said. I've had one preacher right after another call me and ask me or meet me somewhere and say, Preacher, I really don't know what I believe on that subject. I've heard this and I've heard that, and that's one of the reasons why I, I feel the Lord's placed a burden on our heart to bring this study. As you know, I'm not, I don't claim to be a teacher or a Bible scholar or anything like that. I do claim to believe the Bible, and I do claim to be able to read, and I don't, I don't have uh, a whole lot of qualifications in the world's eyes, but I believe the book, and the Holy Ghost is my teacher, and so far we've learned this. A marriage is threefold. We've learned that when people are joined together right, it's physical, it's scriptural, and it's legal. The only, one, the only way that a person can be divorced and marry another and it not be a sin would be to be cut loose entirely from that person physically, scripturally, and legally. In other words, if a man just deserts his wife and goes and shacks up with another woman, that's sin. If a man goes downtown and just gets a divorce for any reason at all and shacks up with another woman or marries another woman, that's adultery. But what about where a man is divorced for fornication, is divorced physically, is dis divorced scripturally, and is divorced legally? What about that guy? He's divorced. He's cut loose. He's no longer bound. He's single. And if a person's single, they do not have a wife. Every once in a while you have somebody come to your church and they want to join your church and people start whispering around and say, he's got two living wives. And normally what they're, what they're referring to is that that guy had a previous wife in the past somewhere that now he's divorced from. Now the first thing wrong with that is it's ridiculous because it's not scriptural language. The term two living wives doesn't occur in the Bible at all. And I'll tell you something else. If a man is physically, scripturally, and legally cut loose and divorced from a woman, she is no longer his wife. He doesn't have a wife if he's divorced from that woman physically. She doesn't live with him. Scripturally for fornication and legally by a legal document from the judge. Go down to the courthouse or in, the, or the, at, in Raleigh in our state capital and see if that fellow's married. Go to the Bible and see if he's married. Go to his house and see if he's married. He's divorced physically. He's divorced scripturally. He's divorced legally. And if he marries another woman, brother, he does not have two wives. He only has one. The only way a man can be, have two wives is to be married to two women. Do you get that? The only way a man legally, scripturally, physically can have two wives be married to two women. You say, well, nobody does that. Well, you, you just lived around here or where, where you lived all your life. There's a whole big world out there, friend. There's a lot of places in the United States where men have multiple wives. And there's plenty of places on the mission field where they have multiple wives. And you can't discount or discredit what I'm saying about a man having two wives. It happens even around here. A lady in our church who has come to our church many or well, several years ago, pulled up one night and called her husband with another woman. She got out of the car and began to question this other woman. She said, what are you doing with my husband? And the other woman said, I don't know what you're talking about. This is my husband. And lo and behold, that fella had married two different women in two different states and kept it a secret. Now there's a man with two living wives. The term two wives, the only way a man can have two wives be married to two women. Jesus 
And the woman at the well in John chapter 4, of course, did not approve of that woman's lifestyle, but he gave the same definition to it as I'm giving to it. In John chapter 4, you know the story there, over there where the woman at the well comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the question, the conversation becomes, about marriage about them, and the Lord gets the root of her problem. And notice what the woman said in, in John chapter 4, and verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Now, she'd been married five times and shacking up with a guy. And the woman said, I have no husband. What did Jesus say? Did he say, well, you're a lying woman, you've got five living husbands, and now you're shacking up with somebody you're not married to. That ain't what he said. You know what Jesus said? Thou hast well said, I have no husband. He agreed with her. He did not condone it. Don't jump ahead of me. He did not say it was okay for her for all these previous marriages. I don't know what broke them. Probably, uh, uh, maybe seeing in her, it, it more than likely probably was. He did not say it was all right what she had done. What he was saying was she didn't have a husband. Now, let me tell you something, friend. When you're divorced from somebody, they're not your husband or your wife anymore. And if a man says, well, this person can't never um, sing in the choir or teach a Sunday school class because he's got two living wives, if a person's married to two people, they shouldn't even join your church. And I've heard of, I've heard of preachers feeling real hypocritical, real hypocritical. One preacher admitted, he said, the only hypocritical thing i ever actually done he said, I, uh, a woman and man come from me and wanted me to perform a wedding ceremony, and I wouldn't do it because of, I, know, I was afraid of what people would say about me, and I just kind of felt like I shouldn't. And I sent them down to the liberal preacher downtown who don't have any convictions or standards or anything and let him marry them and then encouraged them to come back to church next Sunday and come to our church. Boy, that's something, you know, that's something. That's something if a man says, no, it's adultery if you get married. Go down there and let him put his approval on you. Commit adultery and then come back here and be in our church next Sunday. That ain't going to work, brother. That ain't going to hold water. You're not going to pull that stuff on God at the judgment. Now, if they are living in adultery, they need to repent and get right before they join a church. Amen? I mean, a man that'll, uh, that'll say, it's all right if you go down there and commit adultery and then come back up here and be in our church next Sunday. There's something fishy there somewhere. That man's a victim of peer pressure. I don't think a preacher's got any reason at all preaching a sermon to his young people about peer pressure if he himself is more guilty of it than they are. And I tell you, being an independent Baptist, hallelujah, makes you free to be able to say what God wants you to say. You say, well, aren't you afraid of what the other preacher... It doesn't matter if I'm saying the truth. The truth ain't going to hurt nobody. And, of course, I don't want to make any enemies, but... A great day in the morning, I'm not going to let people dictate to me what I can believe and preach just to be accepted by them. Jesus Christ told that woman, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. He agreed with her. Verse 18, For thou hast had, past tense. He did not say you've got five living husbands. That's unscriptural language. That's not the language of Deuteronomy 24. It's not the language of John 4, 18, because the divorce dissolved those marriages, and she had had five husbands, and he said the one you're living with now, of course, you have now, is not thy husband, in that saidest thou truly. You say, preacher, who in the world started all this mess about two living wives and well, it started a long time ago. You know, the Catholic Church, that's about the only way what they can keep members is to forbid them to ever divorce and make, make sure that your marriage has to be performed in the Catholic Church. And they've got the idea that uh, they, they've got this Catholic teaching going around that, that a person has no scriptural right to divorce at all, and they're the same bunch that teaches a priest can never even get married. And the Scripture tells us that is a doctrine of demons. Amen? That's right. Now, you better be real careful about looking down on divorced and remarried people like they're some kind of second-class citizen and set them on the back row somewhere or, you know, always kind of hush-hush around them like they're not up to our level and they're looked at like they're this half-center, half-Christian type of creature. 
And just because you yourself have been fortunate and God blessed you and you've never had a bad marriage. And of course, some of these folks that criticize these divorced and remarried people shacked up with two or three different people before they ever got saved. But just because they never got a legal document and tried to do what's right, they get by with it. Now you think about that for a while and pray about it. I know a, uh, a fellow who married his girlfriend when he was 16 years old. She was 15 years old. They stayed together three months. It didn't work. The marriage was even, uh, I think, uh, made void or is done. They, were, they divorced, and then he got saved. And then he got married. I, God gave him a great Christian wife after he got married when he was about 20 years old. And ever since then, people have been telling him he's got two wives. That ain't going to work, brother. That ain't going to work. If that fella had shacked up with that girl for three months and was, was in sin and didn't even get a legal document, he could have made all the vows he wanted to and promises to her and God and anybody as long as he didn't get that legal document. He could have shacked up for six months or a year and then got saved and married some girl and everybody thought, how wonderful. What a testimony. God has delivered that young. Let's pray that God will send him a good wife. But since he married her and got a legal document and stayed with her three months, they would look at that young man and say, you can't never marry again. You are to stay single and be celibate for the rest of your life. I want to say that's hogwash. That's not a teaching of the Word of God, and you better be real careful before you start telling people stuff like that that's not in the Bible because there's been multiplied tens of thousands of young Christians dropped out of church and backslid and went back to their old sinful ways because they were 20 and 21 and 22 years old and had an unfortunate experience before their salvation or some of them maybe even after their salvation and some preacher look at them and tell them, you have to stay single the rest of your life. They're like those Pharisees in the Word of God that said they bind men with burdens heavy to be bound. They won't touch them with one of their fingers. And I, I guess I've done uh, quit teaching and gone to preaching here, but I, I tell you, it, it's just hard not to sometimes. Uh, it's amazing how demons begin to work in people's heart and mind when you start studying these matters, I guess, especially when you start studying matters of sex and unfaithfulness, boy, the demons begin to crawl. I've told a person before, I, I mentioned some of these things about divorce, and they said, well, you mean just anybody can just up and get a divorce and get married to anybody? No, 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 no. The Lord took care of that. He laid down the provision. He laid down the cause. He laid down the grounds. And what we're doing is teaching it right straight down the middle of the road, what the book says, not going off to the right ditch, nor going off to the left ditch. There are those people who go off to the right and say, well, I'll just, uh, anytime I want to, well, we'll just get a divorce and marry somebody else. That's the world's attitude. They're wrong. There are those who get off on the other ditch and say, well, no one can ever be divorced and remarried for any reason and be right. Well, they're wrong too. The book shoots a straight line and we plowed a straight row on these tapes so far and by the help of God, we'll continue to do that. Now, the other scriptures, before we get to Romans 7, are in Mark chapter 10, where they ask him the question, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And the Lord said, no, if you just divorce your wife and marry another, you commit adultery. We've already covered that. In Matthew chapter 19, if a man just ups and decides to divorce his wife for any reason, the Lord said, it's adultery. But he did not say it was adultery in Mark 10 if it was for fornication. He made the same statement in Luke chapter 16 and verse 18, I believe it is, verse 18, that if a man just divorced his wife and committed adultery, uh, or divorced his wife and married another, he committed adultery. But Jesus did not say that it was adultery if that man divorced and remarried for fornication. So as I said a while ago, the absence of one doctrine in one passage, which is clearly stated in another passage, proves nothing. Just because the Lord didn't mention the exception of fornication in Mark and Luke does not annul, uh, make null and void his teaching on the exception 
in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 9. Now, we're ready for Romans chapter 7. The non-dissolution teachers, as they're referred to many times, are te teachers who teach that nothing can ever dissolve a marriage but death. And notice they have no scripture that says that. Uh, use as their base scripture Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. We're ready to study now Romans chapter 7, verses 1, 2, and 3. Notice we've come along with it just the way the Bible lays it out. We started out in Deuteronomy 24. We talk, talked to you about how that that woman, uh, because of hardness of heart there in Deuteronomy 24, was allowed to go and be another man's wife. Then we came on over to into the New Testament in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, I believe, and then Matthew chapter 19, how that the Lord said, no, you can't do it for every cause. That was for your hardness of your heart. I say unto you, it must be because of fornication. And, uh, and, and in that case, the man was no adulterer if he married someone else. Uh, his second marriage was not adultery. It was not a sin. He did not have two wives. He only had one because his ex or former wife broke the marriage bond. You say, well, what about them vows they made to God, preacher? Well, when a man makes a vow to a woman, and a woman makes a vow to a man, it's a mutual agreement. And those, of course, those wedding vows are not in the Bible. They're just kind of things we just kind of made up, like uh, uh, cherish and honor and this and that and the other. And, uh, they, they're Bible-based, and I'm certainly not against them. I'm for them. But you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised that the people that believe the marriage ceremony is in the Bible. And uh, it shocks them when you tell them that uh, wedding vows are, are nowhere in the Bible. And, of course, I'm not against them. Don't get, don't get excited. I'm for them, and I believe it sh it's good, and it should be done. But wedding vows are mutual. They're mutual. I'll agree to marry you if you'll agree to marry me. See, that's the way, that's the way it works. It's not one-sided. It's mutual. Now, if a man makes a vow before God to love, honor, cherish, take care of, and keep himself physically to a woman, and then a woman makes that vow to him, he's saying, I'll make this vow to you if you'll make this vow to me. And it's a mutual agreement. They both enter into it. Six years later, two months later, five years later, say she breaks the vow, her vow, and goes and joins herself to another man and won't even live with her husband. How can he keep his vow? How can he love her, cherish her, take care of her, support her when she's off living with another man? She broke the contract. And in any law court in the world, in, any, in common sense, teaches you that if one person breaks the contract, the other party is free from its obligation to the contract. What if we made an uh, agreement with Russia? And we said, uh, all right, let's lay down our arms. God knows we shouldn't do that. I'm just making an illustration. Well, if we said, Russia, we'll lay down ours if you'll lay down yours. And they said, all right, we won't shoot you if you won't shoot us. Uh, it's a mutual agreement, right? All right, we make that agreement. And then six months later, Russia starts shooting the bombs at us. Should we just sit back and say, oh, well, we made a vow. We shouldn't, we shouldn't retaliate. No. When they broke the contract, we're released from our vows. And, and don't, don't take that statement to mean more than I intended it to make. I'm, not, I'm certainly not advocating broken marriages. All I'm simply saying is, what in the world is the one person going to do when the other person breaks the contract? It's impossible for them to keep their bargain, their end of the bargain. If, if the other person won't let them love them, cherish them, support them, and all of that, they can't do it. What, what about a case like this? According to Jesus, if it was broken or fornication, that man could marry another, and there's not a word about him being called an adulteress. Now, I know that a lot of people get real worried when you talk like that because they think, great day, preacher, if you say that, everybody will just start, no, no, they won't, no. People that love God want to do what's right. People that don't love God's going to find a way to twist it and get around it and do what they want to anyway. People that love the Lord and believe the book, uh, the truth ain't going to hurt them. And that's what these tapes are for. These tapes are 
to encourage no one to sin. These tapes are to teach the truth because the truth will clear up a lot of this confusion that we have in our churches today on divorce and remarriage and it will help people to serve God and know what they believe and why they believe it and be able to back up what they believe and will get off these ridiculous hobby horses of looking down on divorced and remarried people like they've got some kind of a disease and are not up to par with the so-called first-class Christians. I've never felt like that about divorced and remarried people and uh, uh, even though years and years before I ever dreamed it would ever happen to me, and you never know when or who it might happen to, years and years ago, I always, by the help of God, tried to have a place in my heart and not condemn someone for something that had happened in their past that they would got straight with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're ready for Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 has been used down through the years uh, to try to prove a point that no person can ever be remarried to another person as long as they have a former mate alive somewhere in the world. And what preachers have done is um, taken Romans 7, 3 and used it as a tool to back up what they believe. And of course, that won't work at all. You never use the Bible as a tool to back up what you believe. You just teach the Bible like it says it and leave it alone and let the chips fall where they will. And that's what we'll do here with Romans 7 and verse 1, 2, and 3. Let's read it. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Notice the first thing you'll know, uh, see in Romans 7 is that he's talking to people that know the law. Do you know the law? Do you know what the law teaches about these subjects? You've been, we've been through Deuteronomy 22, been through Deuteronomy 24, uh, we'll get to the scripture later about the priest in Leviticus 17 and uh, 20 and long in there and Deuteronomy 17 about a man having uh, multiplying wives to himself and, and uh, scripture in Malachi about God hated that putting away and that was treacherous putting away. There was no putting away there for fornication. I guess you noticed that in the book of Malachi. Do you know the law? Do you know what the Old Testament says about it? Well, let's read it. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, say before you were saved, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now, now that you're saved, we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness. See, you got a new husband now, spiritually, the Lord Jesus Christ, of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, let's, let's start at the beginning here. In, in Romans chapter 7 and verse number 2. Notice the first thing you've got to notice is that divorce and remarriage are not mentioned in Romans chapter 7. Did you hear what I said? Now don't get mad. Look at your Bible. Divorce and remarriage, much less divorce for fornication, is not mentioned in Romans chapter 7. Let's read it. Look at verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband. Now get your Bible out and look at it with me. It's very important that you get this scripture. Don't go just charging in there like a 12-year-old like a, 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 a on a bulldozer. Uh, you're liable to kill somebody or, and just make a mess. 
for the woman which hath an husband. Now look at it. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. Everybody look at it. Be open-minded. Don't be, don't be narrow-minded and say, well, I don't care what he says. I know what I believe. Look at what the Bible says. You're going to answer for this one of these days. Look at Romans 7, verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband, not a divorced woman, a married woman. We're discussing a married woman here. We are not discussing a divorced woman. The woman which hath an husband, a married woman, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. When two people are married, the law binds them together. But if that husband die, she's loosed from the law of that husband. That's what the verse said. What Romans chapter 7 verse 2 says is this. A woman's bound by the law to her husband. But if her husband dies, she ain't bound to him no more. That's what the verse said. Let's read it again. The woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. In mine and your hillbilly language, it's like this. He said this. If a woman's got a husband, she's bound to that husband. But if he dies, she's not bound to him anymore. Verse 3, so then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Notice it said, while her husband liveth. This is not a divorced woman getting remarried. This is a woman with a husband marrying another man. Nobody in Romans chapter 7 has been divorced. There's no divorce in it. You're reading something into the scripture again that simply is not there. Now notice, it says if this woman who's married goes and marries another man, she's an adulteress. You say, well, she had to get a divorce before she married that up. Now, that ain't what it says. That's like Herodias there in the Gospels. He told, John the Baptist told him, he said, it's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. She married old Philip, and she married old Herodias. And she was an adulteress, and John the Baptist rebuked her for it. But in Romans chapter 7, verse 3, it says, If a woman that's got a husband goes and marries another man, she is an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she can marry anybody she wants to, and she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now listen. Let's get this straight. Now, the first thing you've got to admit, and you may not want to admit this, but Romans chapter 7 is teaching. It's the truth. It's the Word of God. It's inspired. But here's what Romans chapter 7 is teaching. It's teaching that your soul is like to a woman and that it's stuck to your body, which is likened unto a man, and they're married, your soul and your body. Then when you get saved... Your body dies. The flesh dies. That's the man dying, your first husband. And you are free, your soul, to be married to another man, Jesus Christ. Now, any Bible teacher who knows anything about the Word of God will agree with me that that's what that scripture is teaching. Romans chapter 7 is simply teaching. Romans chapter 7 is not a discourse on divorce and remarriage. And you sure are taking it out of context if you try to teach that with it. Like it or not. And you can you can get mad and stomp your feet or you're blue in the face and you ain't going to find divorce and remarriage in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is teaching that when before you get saved, your soul is like a woman married to your body, being your husband, the husband. And when you get saved, the man dies. Your body, your flesh is dead your, because of sin. It dies and your soul is free to marry another man Jesus Christ. The woman here, if you want to talk about divorce or, re or remarriage in this scripture, the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. Now, here's the way, uh, uh, here's the way some preachers teach this. You say, well, well, I believe that scripture means if a divorced person ever gets married again, they're committing adultery. Well, here's how we know you're wrong. Here's the way you read it. Verse 2. Now, I'm going to read it like the opposing teachers would uh, read it. For a divorced woman who had had an husband is still bound by the law to her ex-husband as long as he liveth. But if that man she was married to 
dies, she is free, she is loose from that law of her husband. And if, so then if, while her ex-husband lives, she marries another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her ex-husband dies, she's free from that law, so she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. You say, well, Brother Danny, I think it means that. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, and you can think whatever you want to think, but I know it don't mean that. And you say, well, how do you know? Because that's not what it says. There is not one scripture, not one word in Romans 7, 2, and 3 about any divorced person remarrying. This is a woman married to two men. And you can't make anything else out of it without reading something into the scripture that is not there. And I'll tell you, I found out one thing. A lot of these people like to scream and holler about how they believe the King James Bible. When you really put it right down on them and say, this is what it said, you find out they don't believe it at all. They use it as a tool because they know that's what the people like to hear. But when it goes against something they believe or teach, They'll just soon twist the Word of God and read something else into it as look at their watch to see what time it is and think nothing about it. This is the Word of God we're handling here, friend. And you better watch out about a man who says Romans 7 is talking about a divorced woman that had a former husband, like Deuteronomy 24 said, and then marrying another man, she's an adulteress. Why didn't it say that woman in Deuteronomy 24 was an adulteress? And you say, well, it wasn't God's plan. I know it wasn't God's plan, but it doesn't say she was an adulteress either. It said, if a married woman marries another man, she's an adulteress. There's no scripture teaching in Romans 7 about a divorced person marrying another woman or, or, another, or another man. In Deuteronomy, she could go and be another man's wife, and God didn't stop it, and God did not say she was an adulteress. In Matthew 19, the Lord teaches if a man divorced his wife for fornication, he was no adulteress. And all Israel honored the writing of divorcement. No one dared in the Old Testament call a divorced woman an adulteress if she remarried. Let me say that again. Nobody in the Old Testament dared call a divorced woman an adulteress if she remarried. And you say, oh, preacher, you're just trying to cover up for somebody who's been divorced. No, no, I, that's not fair. You're judging me. I, I could turn the same thing around and say, well, you're just trying to cover for some who haven't. See, we have no right to accuse me of that. Um, some people, when you, when you pin them down with the truth like that, they have no scripture to back up what they believe, and so they just come back with this thing of, well, he's just trying to cover for somebody. Well, what you're doing, I even heard of one preacher who said anybody who taught what I've been teaching was trying to cover up for somebody who's been divorced. That's a big statement, brother. You're accusing a lot of God's men of, some, of a wicked thing. Do you think Dr. John Rawlings from Cincinnati, Ohio, who stood in our church in February of 1990 and said the same thing that I'm teaching you on this tape and even stronger and has been married for over 55 years and is 76 years old, do you think he's trying to cover for himself? What would he have to gain by saying that? Imagine a preacher getting so self-righteous and so just wrapped up in his own little world that he says that anybody who teaches that a divorced for fornication person can never remarry and, be, and it be right is trying to cover for somebody. Imagine that. Imagine a guy saying that Dr. Bob Gray of Jacksonville, Florida, teaches that on divorce just because he's trying to cover for somebody. Imagine a guy saying Dr. Jack Hiles, the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, is just trying to cover for somebody. Or the, or the old Beecham Vick in Detroit, or Dr. John R. Rice, uh, or some of these preachers. Imagine a guy saying, well, they're just trying to cover. for the, the, None of these guys have been divorced and remarried. Now, do you realize what's going on here? You've got a bunch of people being pressured into believing something just because so-called great men, and I'm not denying they are great men, have not studied the subject and have accepted something blindly before digging into the facts. 
And I tell you, a lot of these fellows have really got themselves into a mess, and I'm sure not glad of it. I hope and pray God will help and bless either one of them, every one of them. And I, 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 I want to be their friend and be a blessing to them, and they sure have been a blessing to me. But we're dealing with the truth about divorce and remarriage here, and you got to be real careful. Uh, you realize that if you had two 19-year-old girls come to the altar in your church, let's say, next Sunday morning, and both these girls were 19 years old, and they got saved. Nobody knew them, and little by little, they began to, began to come on Sunday night, began to come to prayer meeting, and began to get involved, and got them a Bible, and just started loving the Lord, and wanting to sing, and work, and do anything for the Lord they could possibly do. Do you realize that if the people in the church, let's say one of them, uh, run off with her boyfriend when she was 17 years old and uh, against her parents' will, they finally gave in to it and they got married. And the boy stayed with her about two years or a year and a half and he ran off and left her. And about a year later, she got her divorce papers in the mail and he had divorced her. He was living with another woman and now married to another woman. And that's her story. Let's call her Girl A. She had been married when she was 17, and her husband divorced her, deserted her, married another woman. Girl B ran off with her boyfriend when she was 17 and just lived with him in an apartment for about a year, and then she lived with another one for about a year. Girl B and Girl A both get saved Sunday morning and start coming to church. Folks, in the name of common sense, do you honestly think it's right? And this is what that girl be told by the majority of so-called Bible-believing preachers in this part of the country. I know it's not like that everywhere. Girl A would be looked at. Girl B would be looked at. Everybody would start saying, Hallelujah, girl B has a wonderful testimony. Let's pray that God will send her a husband and try to fix her up with young men in the church and everything else when she really gets in there and gets on fire for the Lord. And girl A is just as much on fire for the Lord and doing, and they'll look at girl A and say, no, if you ever get married, it's adultery. Now, I love you, and God bless you. I don't want, I don't want no more enemies than I've already got. But by the help and grace of God, I want to try to tell you the truth. There is something wrong with that kind of teaching. There's also a teaching going around. Now, you pray about what I said there a moment ago for about an hour. Just, just ask the Lord about girl A and girl B. Can you imagine telling that girl she's got a... You say, well, bless God, she made vows. Well, how do you know the other girl didn't make vows? She might have made all kinds of vows to, their, to her, the guy she's living with and God too. How come she can get married again and girl A can't? You say, well, because that, you, know, you're, you just think that's that legal document. Just because girl B didn't get a legal document, she's, she gets to get married, and the other girl doesn't, and he broke the legal document? Pray about that for a while, and run the tape back and listen to that illustration again. There's also a teaching going around that among some preachers, I've even got a book, I've got books that give all different views on this thing, and I've got one book in, in my room that says, there's no such thing as an innocent party. And this guy's saying that any time a... a a marriage ends up in divorce, that it had to be both of them's fault. Well, that that is a monumental, ignorant statement to make. I don't know where this guy's been all his life. Does he not deal with people? Does he not read the Bible? God said there was an innocent party. Read Numbers chapter 5, verses 20, 21, and 22, where that adulterous wife and the husband was innocent. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that we'll get to in a little bit where it said the deserted man was not under bondage and then tell me that he was guilty. Read the, the gospel where it said Joseph was getting ready to put Mary away and divorce her and it called him a just man. He didn't say he was sinning. The Bible teaches there is such a thing as the innocent party. In Numbers chapter 5, when a, when a Jew suspected his wife of adultery, but he didn't have any proof, 
He could bring her to the priest and he made her drink water mixed with dust from the tabernacle floor and she was put under an oath and they told her if she had gone aside to another man instead of her husband that he'd cause a, uh, go into her bowels and make her belly to swell and her thigh to rot and the woman had to say amen, amen and the book said the man shall be guiltless. Now run that by me again, you that teach that if a woman goes off and commits adultery and divorces her husband that it had to be partly his fault. Numbers chapter 5 said the man's guiltless. The husband was guiltless in bringing his adulterous wife to the priest and his action was not because of hardness of the heart. It, it, it was purging his house from sin and he could divorce her and remarry and be guiltless while she still lives in her God-cursed body. Moses punished the guilty and set the innocent free. He did not bind virtue with the chains of debauchery. And you know that um, uh, sometimes people are sex perverts and sex criminals and they go off and rape little children and, and everything else and then come home to their innocent mate, sexually innocent, and demand that they become one flesh with them again. And people say they have to do it because the Bible teaches not to defraud. Well, I hope and pray it don't ever happen to you because... You're sure in for a rude awakening. Now listen, as we study Romans chapter 7, we've seen that no divorce and remarriage is even mentioned. Now we're ready to move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the next passages of Scripture in the Bible that deal, that deal with divorce and remarriage. Now we're taking up 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and they had evidently wrote the apostle and asked him some things about marriage problems and they didn't have any scripture to deal with their problems and that's why Paul says some of these things I speak these things by permission and not of commandment he wasn't saying this wasn't the word of God he's just saying there was nothing in the Old Testament that's all he had then you know to deal with this subject and so as the Holy Spirit moved him he wrote these words don't doubt that everything in the book of 1 Corinthians is inspired of God Almighty. Don't ever doubt that. Some people have a lot of problem when Paul said, this is me, not the Lord. All he meant was there was nothing in the Old Testament that God said about this, but I give my judgment, and anybody that believes the Bible believes that the Holy Spirit was inspiring him to say that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 2. If to avoid fornication, that's to keep people from sexual sin, let every man, every man, let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. And then the Bible goes and talks about some, we won't have time to go into all these matters, but it talks about the, the wife doesn't have power of her body. It, the wife's body belongs to the husband. The husband's body belongs to his wife. We'll deal with that verse a little bit later on when we're talking about sex perversion and sex perverts. And if you teach there's no divorce for any cause at all, you're teaching that a man can go off and, and, and sleep with 15 different women and become a homosexual and come home and bring AIDS home and his wife can't refuse him, verse 5. And uh, God help you that it don't ever happen to you, but you better, you, know, you better be careful telling people things like that. Uh, the Lord's not in that kind of talk. Now, we know, according to the Bible, that unless God gives a man a special gift and calling, it's his will for every man and every woman to be married, except for those few that he has given a special gift not to need marriage. Paul being, being an example, and eunuchs that have made themselves under the kingdom of God and all those that could receive that saying. So he said, every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. Then verse 9 tells you that it's better to marry than to burn. And uh, what some of our brethren are trying to tell you, that if you've had an unfortunate marriage in your past, you're supposed to just burn the rest of your life. And that's not talking about burning in fire. That's talking about a sexual drive. And every person who is normal and every person who is healthy has a desire for companionship. And that's why he said it's better to marry than to burn. And then we learn in, in verse number 10 that it's God's will for people to stay together and work it out. And under the marriage, verse 10, he said, I command, yet not I but the Lord. See, there's Old Testament for this. 
let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Here again, we'll stop right there and continue with this study in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 on the reverse side of this tape. Now we're continuing our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and in verse 10, the Lord teaches us a general statement on marriage uh, to stay together, and I believe it's always God's will that people pray together and work out their problems and never get divorced. I think Christian people should get along with each other and do or that is the will of God. He's not talking about one of them committing adultery here. He's not talking about one of them being faithful or deserting the other one. He deals with that down in verse 15. In ver verse 15 he said, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. And here at Rome, or 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 15, we introduce an entire new thought in this study that hasn't been brought up in these other scriptures. So far, the scriptures we've dealt with in Deuteronomy 24 and in uh, Matthew 19 and Matthew 5 and Mark 10 and in Luke 16 have all dealt with what grounds a man could put away his wife on. And so far, our study has, has dealt with how, what right does a person have to divorce, divorce their mate now we're going to talk about a case. What happens when you get divorced by your mate and there's nothing you can do about it? And this brings in a whole new line of thought and the Holy Spirit brings, this isn't covered in Deuteronomy 24, Matthew 5, Matthew 19, Luke 16, or Mark chapter 10. What about where you're deserted by a mate? You see, a lot of these Corinthians and some of these people in these heathen countries have been saved, and because they got saved, some of their, uh, their mates were still lost, and they said, hey, you either denounce the Lord or I'm going to leave you and divorce you. Now, we know it's not right to denounce the Lord, right? You say, well, what happens to a person like that? Uh, what do they do? Well, look at it. 1 Corinthians seven fifteen. If the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. Now, at this point, I want to read you a, a note from the Schofield Bible, the old Schofield Bible here at the bottom of the page. It says, quote, So far from disclaiming inspiration, the apostle associates his teaching with the Lord's. Cases had arisen, verses 12 to 16, as the gospel overflowed Jewish limitations not comprehended in the words of Jesus in Matthew 5 and 19, which were an instruction primarily to Israel. These new conditions demanded authoritative settlement, and only the inspired words of an apostle could give that. Now, what he's saying there is that this situation, a case like this, such cases, as it's called in verse 15, was not covered by the statements of Jesus in Matthew 19. So, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul said, if the unbelieving depart, if, it, if that person just will not live with that mate and leaves them and divorces them, that they were not under bondage. Now, here we go. What in the world does that mean? Not under bondage. Notice that all we've studied thus far has been uh, about the opposite of what person, what right does a person have to put away their wife. Uh, we haven't studied so far what happens to people whose mate divorces them and they have no choice in the matter. And the answer of the Word of God to them, and you meet a lot of people now, that you meet a lot of people that come to your churches and come to the altar and get right with God, and you begin to talk to them and they say, uh, I was married and my husband or my wife uh, left me and, and divorced me and married another person. What am I supposed to do? Well, I don't know what you're going to tell them, but I'm going to tell them what the Bible says. The Bible says they're not under bondage. You say, well, what does that mean? It means exactly what it said. Look it up in the Scripture. In the Bible, you're either bound or you're free. And if you are not under bondage, you are free. And if you're not free, you're under bondage. That can be proved from the Scripture. When, a person, when two people are married, they are tied to each other. You ever notice that? You ever notice when somebody talks about getting married, they say, no, I don't want to get married. I don't want to get tied down. And the idea that people have, and it's scriptural, 
is that when two people are married, they are literally bound to each other. They are tied to. Now, when your mate leaves you and divorces you, you are no longer tied to them. They cut the bond. They cut the rope. And that's what divorce means, cut loose. And if you're cut loose physically, they deserted you. Legally, a judge signed the document. And scripturally, they departed and divorced you. Then you're not under bondage. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 8 gives you the definition of bondage. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Colossians chapter 3 verse 11 gives you the same definition. Bond or free. Revelation chapter 13 verse 16 gives you the same definition. Free and bond. The opposite of bond is free. When the children of Israel were in Egypt, they were in bondage. When they left Egypt, they were free. You say free from what? Free from Egypt. When two people are married, they're, in bond, they're bound and in bondage to each other. When one divorces his mate and that mate has no choice in the matter and they go and join themselves to another person and break that marriage, that person is free. You say, yeah, but it don't mean they can marry somebody else. Well, if it don't mean that, they're still bound. You've got to admit that. You've got to come to the conclusion that if you say they can never get married, that they're still bound to that marriage. Saying this person could never remarry is like saying they are still in bondage to that marriage. You say, well, in the eyes of God. No, no, don't, don't get on that again now. The eyes of God are the Bible, brother. Let me ask you a question. Is that woman bound to a rapist and child molester and homosexual? Could that man who went out and raped little children and committed homosexuality come home to that ex-mate whom he had divorced and say, well, you've got to give me your body because the Bible says defraud not one the other? Of course not. Notice, Verse 10 and 11, you say, well, why did it say up there in 10 and 11 for the, a person not to divorce their wife? We're not talking about a person who divorces their wife or husband in verse 15. We're talking about a Christian brother or sister who's been deserted and been divorced by an unbelieving mate. Now, let's study the difference between bound and bondage and bound just for a moment. The word bondage signifies slavery, to make a slave of, to held by, called by constraint, Hold by constraint or necessity in some matter. To make a slave, to be bound, to enslave. And you get that same definition from Thayer's Greek English lexicon of the New Testament. A Greek English lexicon of the New Testament uh, by Ginrich. A manual Greek lexicon of the New Testament by Abbott Smith. Expository dictionary of the New Testament words by Vine, page 139. And the New Testament Greek. A lexicon and published in 1953. He, in this case, the Christian did not divorce the unbeliever, but the unbeliever divorced the believer. And the Lord did not recognize the divorce in verse 10 and 11 as having dissolved the marriage. In verse 15, he did. You did notice that, didn't you? The Lord told up there in verse 11, they couldn't go marry somebody else. You know why? Because in that case, in the eyes of God, if you like that term so much, they were still husband and wife, and that's why that person couldn't remarry. But if, if it was for fornication, or this person deserted the Christian and divorced them, he did not command them to remain unmarried. The believer was no longer a slave to the marriage. They were free to remarry. If they could not remarry, they were in bondage, right? But before the divorce, they were in bondage to the marriage. After the divorce, the divorce, they were not in bondage to the marriage. You say, yeah, they were. what were they in bondage to? Paul said the wife was bound by the law to her husband. Not her ex-husband that divorced her. Her husband. All right. Now we're getting deep now. I guess... We lost some of you way back down the creek a little ways, but you stay with us 
and run these tapes back and listen to what I've said. In verses 10 and 11, you have the general law of marriage. It's God's will to stay together, and a person should not get a divorce. In verse 15, you see a situation where that a, that a Christian is deserted and divorced by their mate, and they are free. And in verse 39, you see the general law of marriage applied again, where the wife's to stay with her husband as long as they live together, and when her husband dies, she can marry anybody she wants to. Again, no desertion and no fornication. Now let's look back on over there at verse number 27. Now here's some scripture that most people never notice in the scripture. According to the uh, definition of words, bound would refer to being married, loosed would be referred to being unmarried, divorced, or loosed from that law if your mate had died. Now notice verse number 27. First, remember now, when we're studying the word bound, we're talked about uh, just like a, a horse tied to the fence. That's a crude illustration, but I hope you get the point. We're talking about two people who are tied together in marriage, and it's a rope. It's a three-cord rope twisted around itself, and one of those cords is physical, one of them scriptural, and one of them's legal. They're bound to each other. If, listen carefully, if one of those people commit fornication, desert their mate, commit fornication, according to Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 19, that cut the rope physically, they weren't living together, it cut the rope legally when the divorce was signed by the judge and it cut the rope scripturally because it was for fornication and that other person was no longer bound to the marriage. They were loosed. That word, look up that word loose. You know, and I'm not much on Greek. I, I, I think the King James Bible, the Word of God in English and uh, uh, if we got the Word of God in our language, why would, you know, why would we want it in another one? And I'm, not, I'm not against Greek as long as it, people don't use it to contradict the King James. But if you want to look up a Greek word, look up loosed. It means cut. It, it's a divorce. Loosed. It means cut from that bond. That's where that woman was cut from it when her husband died in Romans 7. And if a person cuts it, that's the meaning of the word divorce. It's a divorce when you're loosed. If a person is scripturally divorced, legally divorced, physically divorced, they are loosed from the marriage. Now let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? Are you married? Seek not to be loosed. Now that's plain and simple. Anybody ought to understand that. Are you married? Don't leave your wife. Don't divorce. Don't try to get out of it. Are thou loosed from a wife? Are you divorced? Have you been cut loose from that marriage? Seek not a wife. That means don't just go around looking for a mate all the time. Verse 28. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. You say, who's it talking to, preacher? The fellow who's loosed from a wife in the bottom of verse 27. Let's read it again. Art thou bound unto a wife? Are you married? Seek not to be loose. Don't try to get a divorce and get out of it. Art thou loose from a wife? Are you divorced? Or are you a widower? Seek not a wife. But if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. You say, now preacher, that's talking about a person that ain't never been married. Uh-uh, look at the next part of the verse. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. There's some, the person that's never been married. Now listen, what that verse is saying is this. Are you married? Don't try to get out of it. Are you single because of death or divorce? Don't go looking for a wife. But if you marry, you've not sinned. Now, bound meant total enslavement. Loosed meant total freedom. And brother, if you are free from a marriage and you are divorced physically, you are divorced scripturally, you are divorced legally, 
You are free from that marriage. You are loosed from a wife. And the book says, if you marry, you have not sinned. I don't care what your uncle told you or your kinfolk said and try to condemn you and tell you that you're, that you're lost and on your way to hell because you're in your second marriage. According to the Bible, uh, if a man joined himself to a harlot, he's one flesh. I wonder how many physical wives some of them people's had. And they wasn't married to them legally, but if a man joins himself to a harlot, it, that's kind of it's kind of uh, comical if it wasn't so tragic and terrible about a lot of these preachers talking about somebody having two living husbands or two living because they've been married twice, and some of them had had sexual relations with ten or fifteen, and I have had them tell some of them tell me more than that. Those are physical unions, and you are one flesh with everyone you've ever had sexual intercourse with, according to the book. Now, that stings like an adder, and I know that opens some old wounds, and that, I mean, my words are like acid being poured, you know, on, on something, but nevertheless, the truth's the truth. And I know that uh, a lot of people will get mad, and, and they won't like me no more after this, but um, I believe the people that love the truth will appreciate it, and... It'll help a lot of them. Truth never has been too popular, but it can sure stand on its own two feet. Are you bound to a wife? Don't try to get out of it. Are you loose from a wife? You're out of a marriage because of death or your mate deserting you and divorcing you or a divorce because of fornication? Are you loosed? Don't go out looking. Wait on God. Pray. If you're in that position, just pray. Are you a widower or a divorced person? Don't go looking around. Matter of fact, I'm advise, I would advise that personally to all single people. Don't go looking. Wait on God to send you the right one, and then if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Let's take a break now from our scripture study. We'll uh, get some more scripture here in a little while, and then uh, we're going to hit that great monumental passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3 in just a little bit. And I figure we probably lost a lot of people by now, but I figure we probably gained a lot too. And God always has some people that want to hear the truth and can take it. And uh, if you're a mature Christian, you can take what I'm saying on here and you listen real carefully. We're going to take a break for just a little while on these tapes now and just see, just out of curiosity, how history backs up the position that we've taken on these study tapes. Now, the reason I'm doing this is it's not to prove a point. See, if, if every great man of God that had ever lived since the year of the, of the day of Pentecost had said one thing and the Bible says another thing, then we want to take what the Bible says and disregard them. And so that's, we're not trying to prove our point by quoting anybody. The reason I'm doing this is because you have the funny idea especially around here in the mountains of North Carolina and uh, e eastern Tennessee and upper South Carolina and northern Georgia and this part of the country, you have a weird, strange idea that all great men of God, quote, believed that no one was ever to free to remarry who had been divorced. Now, of course, that simply is not true. I've had people tell me, I had a fellow call me on the phone one time and we were discussing this and we were just discussing it as friends and uh, he was telling me what he thought and I was telling him what I thought the scriptures were saying and he told me, he said, well, if you're right, Brother Danny, why did all the great men of God believe the other way? Now, dear brother, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but all great men of God did not believe that way. Now, let me say this, even if they did even if they did, the Bible determines what's right, not great men. Make sure you get that. The book says great men are not always wise. And so great men don't determine what's right and wrong. The Bible determines what's right and wrong. But when a fellow says great, all great men believe that there was no remarriage after divorce, uh, that fellow is just... He is really, really showing his ignorance. And I, I say that respectfully. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or anything. I'm going to now give you proof from church history. And anyone who ignores this certainly has a problem 
and their problem is preacher peer pressure or else they've already stuck their neck out and too ashamed to examine the facts. Now listen, I had a preacher friend of mine who discussed these matters with another preacher and he was showing him the truth about marriage and divorce and remarriage as I've showed you here on these tapes. And the other preacher's eyes were opened and he saw the truth and he said this. He said, brother, I agree with you. He said, I really do. I know that you're right and I've seen the truth. But he said, I could never go back and tell my congregation that now because I preached it the other way all these years and I'd make a fool out of myself. You know, I've thought a lot about that. And I thought, how pitiful, how pitiful, how pitiful it must be to have to live every day knowing that you can't preach what you believe and that you can't preach what is right because you're afraid of what somebody might say about you. You know, it, is, it ain't no wonder God don't bless in a lot of our churches. It's no wonder the Holy Spirit has departed in many cases and some of these churches that claim to have their doctrines so straight and won't even let a divorced person join are deader than last year's bird nest. It isn't any wonder. There's, there's so much junk going on in the name of God and hiding behind Christianity that it's plum pitiful. I tell you, brother, if by the help of God, I've been preaching for 17 years and I've always been allowed by the help and grace of God if to preach what I believe is right and, of course, I, I pastor a church now. Our church is the largest church in our county. And God's been good to us, and we appreciate it. And I started out preaching on the street. And if it ever gets to the place where I can't preach what I believe in our church, I want to go right back and preach out on the street where I can have the freedom and preach what I believe. Amen? I tell you, I don't ever want to get tied up in a church to where I'm afraid to say what's right and afraid to say what I believe just because of a few members in the church that won't like it or upsetting the ship or rocking the boat. Brother, I think a man ought to just rear back under the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God and preach that book like it stands and let her rip. Hallelujah. I, I'm about to get excited right here now. But I tell you, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I've got a book and I'm glad the book will set you free. Truth will set you free and you'll be free indeed. Amen. All right, I'm going to get on in with this before I got off the subject there a little bit. I'm going to give you some quotes from church history. Quotes from church, church history where great men, if you want to call it that, uh, I guess that's the right term to use if you want to, are taking the same position that I've taken on these tapes. So you will begin to see in just a moment, uh, as I begin to read this scripture, you, or these, this, this, uh, these quotes from church history, rather, you will begin to see that quote, all great men didn't believe, as the other uh, teaching goes. As a matter of fact, most, quote, great men that we have any evidence of them making statements on these matters agreed with the position on these tapes. That'll be a shock to some of you, but now I want to start with these quotes. And I know it'll be a blessing to you if you'll listen. And if you're listening to these tapes in your car or or maybe at work or something like that. Maybe you can get them home and go through them again slow because I'm giving you a whole lot of material on here and we're just about almost halfway through now. We've got a long ways to go. All right. Here's some quotes from church history. All we're dealing with right now is the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You remember what I uh, talked to you, to you about a while ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about the deserted party uh, being free to remarry? You say, well, Lord, nobody ever taught that to the last 10 years. I, now, just because you didn't hear it, friend, don't mean nobody ever taught it. All right, now you ready? You ready to find out how wrong you are? And I'm not trying to be smart. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Here we go. The Protestant commentators of the 16th and 17th century, or the large majority of them, draw the liberty of remarriage after desertion from the word of Paul, 1 Corinthians 7, 15. You know what that comes from? That comes from an essay on divorce and divorce legislation by Theodore Woosley, D.D., L.L.D., 
page 134, 135, published 1869. Now tell me that nobody believed that to the last 10 years. You know what he said? Quote. This is a quote from Woosley's book, page 135, published in 1869. Quote. She is not bound to remain unmarried and to wait for or to seek for reconciliation. Now let me run that by you again. Now I'm not saying I condone or go along with all these men that I'm getting ready to quote. All I'm trying to do is shoot down this ridiculous, ignorant rumor that is being circulated by preachers that nobody ever believed this way until the last 20 or 30 years. It's ridiculous. Not 1869, quote, she is not bound to remain unmarried and to wait for or to seek for reconciliation. Did you get that? Theodore Woosley, 1869. All right. Is that far enough back for you? Listen to this one. Quoted by Woosley on page 79. And this was written by a German theologian who lived between 17 and 1850. 1789 and 1850, and in church history in Berlin from 1813 wrote this, quote, Protestant exegesis has understood the apostle, 1 Corinthians 7, 15, to the effect that in such a case the Christian party would be authorized to enter into a new marriage. <clears throat> now listen. Remarriage after divorce was allowed by the church leaders in the earliest centuries of the church on the exception of Matthew 5.32, Matthew 19.9, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15. You want to go back further than that? How about 185 A.D. from Origen? And I certainly don't agree with all that Origen said or taught. I'm just, giving, I'm just telling you that people believed this before me and you got here. 185 A.D., quote, Some bishops in his time permitted a woman to marry while her former, well, I'm glad they got it right, husband was living. Notice how scriptural people talked then and how unscriptural her former, well, I'm glad they got it right, husband was living. Notice how scriptural people talked then and how unscriptural people talk now. And we hear a lot of uh, criticism about these Christian rock groups, and I preach against it too, about being unscriptural in their song. A lot of times we're just as unscriptural in our ridiculous statements about matters like we've been studying here. Let me give you the pulpit commentary. Uh, the old pulpit commentary, 200, page 251, volume 44, the old edition, says, quote, 1 Corinthians 7.15 is generally adduced as the Bible warrant for the view that willful desertion is sufficient reason for divorce, such desertion is de facto rupture of the marriage and stands on the same footing as adultery. All right, let's get another one. This is from the Encyclopedia Standard Bible, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia around 1899 from the Erdman Publishing Company, uh, 1950, wait a minute, I'm sorry, from the Erdman Publishing Company, I believe, and it says this. 1 Corinthians 7.15 allows remarriage where a Christian partner is deserted by a heathen. All right, how about this one? Hastings Dictionary of the Bible, page 586. You say, when was this written, preacher? Nobody ever believed this till 10, 15, 20 years ago. Well, this was in 1918. Quote, if the unbeliever wishes to dissolve the union, it may be dissolved. And that word dissolve means it's as if they had never been married. Let me give you another one. Notes on the Epistles of Paul by Bishop Lightfoot. Page 226, quote, The deserted party seems to be left more at liberty to marry another person. 
it does not seem reasonable that they should still be bound. In such a case, marriage would be servitude indeed. That comes from Matthew Henry's commentary in 1 Corinthians 7.15. The first quote was from the Epistles of Paul from Bishop Lightfoot. All right. This is from the Oxford University Press, page 257. Quote, this divorce authorizes remarriage. It would seem authorizes remarriage since the believer ceases to be bound. His previous marriage is now disqualified. Now remember, I'm not condoning all these folks I'm quoting. I'm getting ready to quote a bunch more church uh, historians in just a few minutes, but just keep in mind, I'm just, I'm just giving you evidence to support what I'm saying that people did believe this. In 1200, in 1100, in 900, they always have since the days of the church because that's what the Bible meant and does mean now. All right, Baker's Dictionary of Theology. Quote, Paul addresses Christians in verse 15 there in 1 Corinthians who were joined in mixed marriages to unbeliever which Christ had not considered when addressing Jews, namely that if the unbelieving spouse desires to break the marriage bond by deserting the Christian, the latter is not bound but is free to remarry. All right. How about some of these fellows like this? Uh, a, a work called A Companion to the Bible by Oxford Press. Quote, The Eastern Church consistently saw in adultery a legitimate cause of divorce which permits the remarriage of the divorcee. How about... Um, from the, the pulpit commentary again, volume 36, page 96. The Oriental and most Reformed churches hold that, in the accepted case, both husband and wife may contract a fresh marriage. Now, few people, few people know the historical facts about this divorce issue. They heard somebody preach something or they heard somebody said something and they just make popish statements of, without having studied it out. They don't realize that the Eastern Church Fathers usually were superior theologians when it comes to the Word of God than the Western Fathers. And almost all of the English Reformers or by the 16th century regarded the teaching that a person could never divorce and remarry as a popish invention. That means invented by the Pope. They all agreed, as far as any evidence I've been able to find, that divorce with liberty for the innocent party to remarry should be granted for adultery, and most of them regarded malicious desertion as a second, second legitimate cause for the dissolution of the marriage, according to 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 15. That comes from the history of human marriage, 1922, by the Macmillan Company. I heard a, a preacher told me, he said, well, nobody ever believed that till so-and-so started saying it. Well, uh, young preachers make a lot of statements. I made a lot of statements when I first started preaching, and I had to eat some things, too. And if you're too stubborn to ever go back and eat some things when somebody shows you you're wrong, then God can't bless you and use you like he wants to if you're not willing to face up to the truth. You don't have to worry about your reputation. You don't have one. We're nothing. There's none of us anything. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. There's no use in us strutting around like we're a big shot when all we are is a sinners that would be in hell or on our way if it wasn't for the grace of God. Just face up to the truth, and God will bless you, and, and uh, he'll help you. Now, another opinion on Essay on Divorce and Legislation, Essay on Divorce and Legislation by, in 1535, allows a woman whose husband had absconded several years before to marry again, according to the decision of Paul and according to the former practice in Christendom, as a similar case cited by Eusebius from Justin and the example of the Fedolia show. Now listen to these quotes, and I'm sure you wouldn't deny these men were, quote, great men. Quote, Martin Luther, 1 Corinthians 7.15, 
This is from the Reformation Writings of Martin Luther, page 307, Lutterworth Press, from London. In Martin Luther's day, he said, quote, Here the apostle rules that the unbeliever who deserts his wife should be divorced, and he pronounces the believer free to marry another. Now tell me that Martin Luther is one of these modern-day compromising soap opera brainwashed televangelist or backslid Baptist preachers who's just going along with our current divorce rate. Look me right straight in the eye and say every preacher who teaches that it's just because there's so many people in the congregation divorced and our divorce rate's 53 percent and he's trying to cover up one. Was Martin Luther trying to cover for him? Quote, Here the apostle rules that the unbeliever who deserts his wife should be divorced, and he pronounces the believer free to marry another. Do you believe that man loved God? Do you believe that man was sincere? Are you kidding? All right. What about Mackenclock and Strong Encyclopedia, Volume 2, published in 1878? Quote, On the Church Fathers, the church fathers, to some extent, understood 7.15 of 1 Corinthians to mean at liberty to contract a new marriage. This is from the 20th Century Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, page 344, published by Baker Bookhouse. Quote, Many spiritually minded pastors believe that adultery or willful and permanent desertion can kill a marriage as surely as though the innocent party were in his grave. Now here's a quote from the Archbishop of Canterbury. This might surprise you. Quote, Clearly St. Paul's direction is that a valid marriage may be in these circumstances ended and a new marriage entered into. You can see also a Manual Greek Lexicon of the New Testament by Abbott Smith, page 273, published in 1921. You can see a Greek Lexicon of the Roman and Byzantine period, pub, page 723, published in 1887, and uh, numerous other works that we won't take time to cite right now. And we'll give you some more quotes from some of these other, quote, great men. How about this one? 1906. Has the opinion of the divine since the Re Reformation has leaned toward the view held by the Eastern Church. That means a person could remarry after, after divorce for fornication or adultery. Now, that word loose there in 1 Corinthians 7, 27 that we looked at a while ago where it said, Art thou loosed from a wife? According to the Thayer's Greek-English Lexicon, page 384, means divorce. Quote, A loosing of any bond as that of marriage, hence once in the New Testament of divorce. 1 Corinthians 7, 27. Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? And according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, that's speaking of divorce, seek not a wife. Next verse. Nevertheless, if thou marry, but an if, thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Now why didn't Paul tell that divorced man to remain single? Well, uh, it's all because of the cause of the divorce. And that makes all the difference in the world. Now let me give you what some of the great reformers said about divorce and remarriage. And then you begin to realize that the, the folks in Christianity who believe like I'm teaching you on these tapes are not in the minority at all, but it seems like over church history would be the majority. Listen to this. Martin Luther in the 1500s. This is published from the Reformation Writings of Martin Luther by Wolf, page 307, 
from Le uh, Letterworth Press in London, 1952. Quote, I marvel even more that the Romanists do, lot, do not allow remarriage of a man separated from his wife by divorce, but compel him to remain single. Now here's something some of you Baptist preachers better get. The teaching, hear me carefully, the teaching that a man who's divorced for adultery can never remarry is not a Baptist teaching. It is not a Bible teaching. It is a Roman teaching. And anybody ought to know it would be Martin Luther, wouldn't you think, in the 1500s? You say, well, I knew some great Baptist. It is a Baptist teaching, too, and you shouldn't say that. Not originally. Listen to what Martin Luther said in the 1500s. Quote, I marvel even more that the Romanists do not allow remarriage of a man separated from his wife by divorce, but compel him to remain single. Christ permitted divorce in case of fornication and compelled no one to remain single. And Paul preferred us rather marry rather than to burn and seemed quite prepared to grant that a man may marry another woman in the place of the one he has repudiated. Now, that's from Martin Luther in the 1500s. He said, he said, it, he said it blows my mind that these Romanists don't allow the remarriage of a man separated from his wife by divorce because it's so clear in the scripture when a man separated by divorce for fornication. He said Christ permitted divorce on those grounds and compelled no one to remain single. And I'm, I tell you, I want to go to bat for my brothers and sisters that have been through an unfortunate marriage. I tell you, folks, it's bad enough when people look at you like you got some kind of disease and look at you like you're some kind of a failure in life or look at you like, well, you had to do something wrong or your marriage wouldn't have. I, I would hate to see what some of those folks would do in the same situation. And many of them are not even serving God today because of the trauma and tragedy and heartbreak. Uh, you've, never, you've never been humiliated and hurt anymore in your life. Death in the family is easy to go through compared to a divorce. Did you hear me? It's a terrible, tragic thing. And it makes it a lot worse when the world laughs at you and then people, somebody steals your mate and they go live with somebody else and then you come to the house of God and the Christians look down their nose at you like you have done something terrible and tell you to be a eunuch the rest of your life. I don't believe God's in such a teaching, and I believe that the holier-than-thou, self-righteous people uh, who try to push their doctrinal beliefs with no spiritual uh, scripture to back them up what their spiritual beliefs are are in trouble with the Lord and going to be one of these days for making commandments that God Almighty never made. The Lord Jesus never, never compelled nobody to remain single after they were divorced for fornication. And make sure you don't misquote me now and uh, listen to what I'm saying. On the next tape, we're going to continue this study of what says church history. And I'm going to give you some more quotes from men that it may surprise you for, uh, that you'll be hearing from, from people like uh, Philip Shaw, from John Wesley, from Charles Spurgeon, and right on up to the men of God in our generation. So on tape number three, 